Bibles, if you will, to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18. I want to start a series on Sunday morning in, with this topic in mind, that God is greater. Gra God is greater. He's greater than anything. He's going to be greater than our problems. He's greater than our enemies. He's greater than our discouragements. So we're going to look at a number of things over the next couple weeks that God is greater than. We live in a day where it's so easy to get discouraged about things. It may be discouraging about relationships. It could be discouraging about your job situation that you're frustrated in. It might be discouragement about your, the, what, the political environment, right? Man, that's just, turn on the news, that's discouraging if you look at that. But no matter what we look at, God is, God is greater than, than all those things. So we're going to look at this in Psalms chapter 18. Now we're going to start out this week a little bit different. We're going to talk about who God is. And when we look at some things about who God is, it's easy to understand why God is greater than all these things. Because who he is. I'm so thankful it was be November. I don't know the day. don't remember the day. But November um, this year, it'll be 41 years when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior as a young boy, growing up in a preacher's home, and I remember going and talking to my parents at the counter and talking to them about some neighbor friends that I was close to and we'd got to know and just asked my parents, you know, what would happen to them if they were to die? And my parents used that to say, well, what would happen to you? Do you know the Lord? Or do you know for sure you're, you'd have a home in heaven? And so I trusted Christ as a young boy. And I'm thankful for that, that growing up, you know, as a child and, and being able to know the Lord from a young age. And I'm thankful for it. And as, over that time, you know, when I trusted Christ as a young child, I didn't truly understand all who God was. Now, I knew he was my savior. I knew he could take care of all my sin. And I knew he was God. But I didn't know a lot about him. It took time over the years that I began in my Christian life to begin to know more about God. And that's a continual process. Does it make a difference if you've been saved a year, if you've been saved a month, if you've been saved 20 years or 80 years? That's a process you go through in your Christian life. And you should be going, growing to know God more in your Christian life. In Psalms chapter 18, starting at verse number 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. We're going to look at those this morning, that list, if you will, of who God is, and that God is greater. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings to us. Lord, we thank you for how good you are to us. Lord, even just the verse and a couple chapters over about the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. God, that we are so blessed to live in this country, to have the freedoms that we have and we enjoy. Um, the freedom to worship, the freedom to share the gospel, the freedom to, of expression. Lord, we ask that you would turn our country back to you. And I pray that you would Use the scriptures this morning that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit's power and you would speak to our hearts through the word of God. Help me to say the things that you'd want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm studying in the book of Psalms, and as I've been studying in the book of Psalms, this is one of the chapters that I have gone through in my own personal devotions. I've read the Psalms a lot of times. Psalms is great when you're going through maybe discouraging times. Psalms is great when you are going through times that you just want God to just do a real work in your life. There's times in the, in the Psalms that you see the psalmist is on the mountaintop. It's like he's at the mountain height looking over all the other mountains and looking at all the splendor and looking down at all the little small maybe villages that are out there or whatever it is. But he's at the top and, the, and everything is going well and it's going smooth. But there's also the times that you see the Psalms, the valley times, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There's the times that you see in the Psalms that the psalmist is going through a very dark time. It seems that everything is going against that person. And then he goes, and it's almost like he runs and he claims the promises, that he grabs a hold of a truth, he grabs a hold 
of a promise that even though everything is dark, even though everything is discouraging, he runs to this promise and he just holds on to it. When we start out this chapter, the psalmist is saying, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. It's interesting when you look at that word love, it's not, you know, it's not maybe a love like, oh, I love chocolate, right? There's a lot of things I love. I do love anything with sugar in it almost, except for apple pie. Do not like apple pie. I don't know why, but don't like mushy, gushy apples. Nasty. Ugh. Okay? But I do like chocolate. If it has sugar in it, you know, I, I, like those, I like those things. But I don't like chocolate the same way I like my spouse, right? 23 years when we got married. Um, you know, I love her more now than I, than I loved her at that time. But it's different than my love for chocolate. There's a different love that we have for um, maybe something we do that we just really enjoy. There's the love that we have of towards a parent. Matter of fact, when you look at this, this part here of I will love thee, O Lord, it's almost like a child. You ever see a child and you go up to a child, maybe that child doesn't know you very well, and you go up to that child and you say hi, and that child runs over to their mom or they run over their dad and they grab them as tight as they can around their legs, right? They're holding them just tight, like, you can't get me. My dad's got me, right? You big, bad boogeyman, you know, I've got my dad or my mom, and you can't pull me away. That's what it's talking about here. Do you ever have that time in your life when you're going through a difficult time, and it's like you just need, it's almost like you want to just, Grab a hold of God and not let him go. Maybe it's in a prayer time that you've gone to that prayer closet or you've gone to that prayer place you have and you've poured out your heart and it's like God just met with you and you just don't want to leave it because it's, he's there and he's so real to you and you feel it's like it's almost like he's just right there right next to you and you just want to hold on to him. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. He says, Lord, I love you. I want to just hold on to you. And then he uses these different portions to describe who God is. The first one we see here in this portion as we look at it is, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord, we'll come back to strength, but the Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. I was thinking about this. It's, this is not like the little rocks that are out in the parking lot that you throw, right? Not that kind of rock. What this is talking about is a big rock. A big rock that is like a foundational rock. Something that is just unmovable. I saw we were watching a program, it's been a while back, about different amazing things. And I guess, I think it was over in um, Burma or one of those countries that there's this rock that's just balanced perfectly. It looks like you could go over there and push it and it would fall over because it's like balanced on this little edge of the cliff, if you will. But you can't do that because it's a rock. It's firm. It's there. When we think about God and the psalmist is talking about God and God is greater, he's saying, God is my rock. He's what I steady myself on. He's my secure place. That thing that though everything around me may be changing and everything around me may be in turmoil, God is unchanging. He's always the same. You know, we don't get an update to the Word of God. There's no need for, oh, we need something new. It, it's, it's there. He's always the same. He always has been and He always will be. He's my rock. It's talking about an unmovable rock, safety and security. Psalms 18, verse 31 said, For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? You think about the psalmist. The psalmist knew people around that prayed to Dagon, that prayed to Molech, right? That prayed to these false gods that could do nothing. But he knew that his God, who is the Lord, save the Lord. Who is? He's my rock. He is that rock that I can hold on to, that when anything around me 
is in turmoil or difficulty, I can grab a hold. Psalms 28.1 says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. When I think of the Lord being my rock, I'm reminded of that little story the Lord told in the Gospels. Right? We sing a song. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, right? And the rains came down, right? And the floods came up, but the house on the rock stood firm. If you want to have something that is unshaken, if you want your home to be in a place that though all the world is in difficulty and turmoil and false philosophies and all this craziness going on, if you want something, you build your home on Christ. If you want a marriage that's going to last, if you want a relationship that will stand the tests of the storms, you must build your home, your marriage on Christ. Amen. See, everything else is going to be changing at times. There's things that come along and relationships come and sometimes relationships go and friends are there for a time and friends leave. Our life changes. We change. But God never changes. So when I go to God and I, and I need his help and I need his direction and I need him, I can run to him because he's my rock. And as I build my home on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have a home that can stand the tests of the storms that are going to come because it's founded on Christ. He's founded on my rock. For me, when the world is shaking, he's my rock because I know that he is in control. I know he's there. Not only is he my rock, but he is my fortress. My fortress. There's been a few times I've gotten to go overseas, and I've gotten to go look at some of the different castles. Um, one of them that I enjoyed was, is like, I think it's St. James's Castle in London. And it's the same St. James that helped bring the translators together for the Bible. But to go look at that and you see how they would build that fortress so the enemy could come and attack and there was multiple layers of defense. You know, they have a moat around it. Sometimes they'd have even another spot of grass that they would put lions and tigers and all this other stuff in this area. You would go up and you would see that you have a big heavy wall that's there that you'd have to either bust in the gate or find a way over. And sometimes if you got over that one, you'd have another one inside that you'd have to get to. And all between that, they've like, and meanwhile, on this fortress or in these castles, you had people looking out those little peepholes that are trying to shoot you as you get close. And it was very difficult to overcome this. But you know, when God is your fortress, there is nothing that can overcome him. Nothing. He's my fortress. You know, when they would be out and the enemy would come into an area, people would run to the fortress. They would run to the fortress, they would bar the gates, and they would run into it and hide and seek protection from their enemy. Our God is a fortress for those. I can run to him, I can go to him, and I can run to the fortress and I can be the place where I find safety. Not only do I find safety, but I can sleep in safety. You know, uh, uh, um, you can put all kinds of things to keep the enemy from coming into your house, burglarizing your house, right? You put an alarm system, maybe get a big guard dog. You can even go on the watch and stand outside, you know, armed or something like that. But eventually you have to sleep. But God never sleeps. I can trust when I'm in his will and I'm leaning on him as my fortress that he's always there. He's always alert. He never takes a break. He never walks away. He never is off the job. He's my fortress. I run to him and say, God, I need help. I feel like I'm being besieged by the enemy by those that are coming in to criticize or to tear me down or discourage me. 
but God, you're my fortress. I need your help. Psalms 31.3, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Many times in scripture, you find that these words are together. My rock, my fortress. Psalms 91, 2, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Psalms, or Jeremiah 10, 17, gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. People would run to those things. But David is saying, God, you are my security. Think about David for a minute. How many times he had to be on the run? Right? Saul trying to get him. Philistines trying to get him. Absalom trying to get him. But he knew that his security was not found in his men. His security wasn't found in the place where he was hiding. His security was found in God. And for the Christian. We need to realize he is my security. He's my place that I can run to. And I can go when, when the world is beating me, I can go and I can shut the door and shut out the world and bow my head and go into the throne room and say, God, you're my fortress. You're my place. Number three, he is my deliverer. My deliverer. Do you ever feel like you are bound in chains? Maybe to some sin that beset you, right? Some sin that you struggled with to overcome. That you just felt like, man, I, how do I get victory over this? Maybe you've asked people to pray with you over it. And you just feel like, but, but then I just go right back to this. I can't seem to, to break free. The Bible says that God is my deliverer. He is the one who can come and deliver me. He is, the, he is the one who fights my battles. Sometimes we try to do, we want to fight our battles ourselves, right? Well, I just want to get back at this person. I just want to tell them like it is. I just want to do this. Or I just go to God and say, God, you're the deliverer. Why don't I just trust that you're going you're gonna to handle this? You can fight my battles for me. Far better than I could ever fight the battle. He's my, he's my deliverer. When you look at this and you find that in Judges 3, verse 15, it says, But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. I like this guy. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto the king, unto Eglon, the king of Moab. It was a pretty interesting present, if you go read what kind of present they took him. <laughs> Not one that you want to get. But you know what they did when they cried to God? God said, I'm going to send you a deliverer. What you need is someone to deliver you. Sometimes there are situations that are going to be too big for you to handle. You don't know what to do. But God does. He can deliver you. He can send what is needed. He can help. And he, he's the deliverer um, in uh, Judges 3.9. It says, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer of the children, to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel. Caleb, it's Caleb's younger brother. God provided when they cried out to God a deliverer. You know so many times why we don't have a deliverer is because we didn't cry out to God. We, do, we just thought, tried to handle it on our own. If you think about it, to me, this, I was reading something one time, and it's so true. You know, for us, we don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what is going to happen when you leave these doors. Now, you have planned, probably, that you're going to eat lunch today, right? You probably planned that maybe you're going to take a nap this afternoon. But we don't know what's in our tomorrow. We don't know if, your, if our heart's going to keep beating when we walk out these doors or how long we have. But God does. God knows everything that's going to happen to you. Tomorrow, the next day. He knows if you need guidance for your life. He knows if you, who your spouse, right, that he's going to, where they are. He knows what, you know, all these things. 
So why wouldn't I start my day with him and say, God, I don't know what today brings, but I know that you, I need your help today. I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. I need your protection from all these crazy Texas drivers, right? <laughs> I need it, right? I need that. Because he is my deliverer. He knows what's coming. So I can go to him and say, God, you already know these things. But I don't. But I need you to help me. I need you to walk with me today. I need, the Bible says that we're to put on the armor of God to prepare for the evil day. You know, maybe your day has been super smooth. Maybe it started with you, uh, you know, fighting on the way in. Who knows, right? But here's the thing, you, don't know, you and I don't know what day is going to be our evil day. That Satan or the flesh or all these things that are going to come to attack us. But God does. So when I go to him and say, God, I need your help, I need your protection, I need your deliverance because I don't know what I, what's happening to me today. I'm just going to trust in you. He is my deliverer. Matter of fact, the Lord said in Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The world that we live in today is in bondage. They don't know. They may not even know they're in bondage. But they're in bondage to the world. They're in bondage to sin. They're in bondage to all these things that, that are damaging to them. And it's our job as Christians to preach the gospel to say, there is freedom in Christ. And when you know Christ, he sets you free because he's your deliverer. He's our deliverer. He's our strength. Our strength. He carries me through. Matter of fact, this, root, this word here is talking about that God being the strength of the psalmist. Did you ever run out of strength? Try to lift something up and you couldn't do it? Try to accomplish something and it just didn't, you couldn't get it done. It was beyond your ability, right? You may even thought as a guy, whoa, I'm just going to man up and, whoa, you know, my brother Adam, we used to tease him. He was beefier strength-wise than us, but some of us were a little wiser. We would tell my brother Adam, we would say, hey, you're not man enough to do it. <laughs> and guess what would happen? Whatever chore that I did not want to do, right, that I was trying to get out of, the minute I told my brother, oh, well, you're just, no, 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 you're just not man enough to do it. Guess what he was going to do? He was going to find a way to do it. Right? Oh, I'll show you I'm man enough to do it. You know, whatever. And he goes over there and does, like, yeah, I didn't have to do it, right? He got it done for me. <laughs> and he would just go off doing it. But, you know, sometimes we, we've tried to do something in our own strength and it doesn't work. But God is our strength. Matter of fact, 1 Chronicles 16, 11 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. When you feel low, you run to God and say, God, I need your help. I don't know what to do. I need your strength. I need you to help me make it through this. Make it through this day. Make it through this circumstance. I need your strength. Psalms 18.32, a verse later in the chapter. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He is the one who gives me that strength. Psalms 18.39. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. How do you think those people would go out and fight these battles and go for over 24, 24 hours or a different time fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat in the situations they were in? How is it that one, th one of them could put a thousand to flight? Right? Because God was their strength. He helped them. He gave them the strength. And David knew that. He said, it's God that girdeth me with strength. But you and I are no different as a Christian. We can go to him and ask him for the, our strength to help us get through. Next, he's the horn of my salvation. Now this one I kind of, 
went back and forth in my mind. Horn of my salvation. Horn of my salvation. What does that mean? Matter of fact, when you look at this portion of Scripture, it's not found said this way very many times in Scripture. In Luke 1.39, it says, And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, there's some people who say, well, it was, it means about a strength of a horn, right? An oxen, or you see these cattle with the big long horns and pushing them for strength. I don't know. Maybe that's really what he's talking about. But horn of salvation, I begin to look and, and you think about what else did they use the horns for? Okay, Timothy, get my illustration here. Now, Sam, let us borrow his um, horn, okay? And, and they would use the horn back then of an animal for different things. Matter of fact, they would use it to call people for things. Call of battle, right? Get the, get the small one and the big one. Can you get big one? Now, I'm not going to ask Timothy to blow it because I don't know if Timothy can blow it or not. Sam didn't want to try. He didn't want to be embarrassed in the front with all of us. <laughs> but, but they would use a horn to call. Okay, so he's got his... Now, when they would go out, matter of fact, if you look at the tower, when they would go, went to fight Jericho, get the small one too, right? So this is the big one, Right? The shofar, right? Is this the shofar? Yes. Hit the small, hit the small one too. There you go, Timothy. Okay, this is the small one. But they would use these to call people to fight or to announce an impending battle. Now, when I look at this portion of Scripture and I look at these previous ones, I will love the O Lord my... Oh, the Lord is my rock. Okay, he's my security. He's where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be secured on. He's my fortress. Okay, well, I can run and go and hide in my fortress. He's my deliverer. He's going to go out and, and he, he'll deliver me from bondage. He's my strength. Okay, he's going to give me that strength. But wait, he's my, he's my horn. He's, he's my horn. I, when you look at this, I wonder if we see him announcing that he is going to do something on my behalf. Proclaiming to everyone else, this is my child. I'm coming. I'll deal with it. Do you ever watch, and maybe it was kids growing up, and you see these kids kind of going back and forth, and along walks in a big brother or a big sister, I remember one time we were at Vacation Bible School, and I'm in, I, I was out of the age of being in Vacation Bible School. I'm in the, in the church building, I'm looking out, and we had bust in a bunch of kids. They were there, and I look out there, and I see my brother Adam, who I you know, would tell, you're not man enough, surrounded by these kids who look like they're getting ready to get him. And I looked out the window, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, that's my younger brother. Now, if you mess with one Han, you're going to mess with a whole lot more than just one. Like, I'm the oldest of nine, okay? So there's a bunch of us. Now, there's a lot of them were younger at that point. I took off running, and I start yelling as I go. You know, hey, he's my younger brother. What are you doing? I probably was even yelling out, I'm the pastor's son or something at that point, right? <laughs> Trying to figure out something to bring extra help. Because I was going out there to deliver my younger brother from whatever was getting ready to happen. But wait a minute. Aren't there the times when I feel like everyone's on me? Everyone's trying to get me. And I run to God. And you know what God does? David said, he's my horn of my salvation. Announcing to all the world, I'm coming to save him. I'm so thankful that on that cross, he wasn't just saving this person or that person, but he came to save me individually. He came to save you. 
And the psalmist say, he's, my, he's the horn of my salvation. He is coming and he's my deliverer. And you see him coming. Then you put that down, Timothy. Next, we see he's my buckler. He's my buckler. And it's interesting when you look at this buckler. Some people think it's a small shield. Some people said, no, it's a big shield that covers you. Matter of fact, in Psalms 91, 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Proverbs 2, 7, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. I don't know whether this is a big shield or a small shield. But I know one thing that David was saying. Nothing can get to me that God does not allow. There's no circumstance for the Christian that will get to you unless God allows it to go through. Matter of fact, we see in Ephesians that we're to take on the shield of faith that is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. For me as a Christian, when God is my buckler, he is there between me and the enemy and every single dart that the enemy is going to try and throw at me to take me down, to wound me, to kill me, to destroy me, gets quenched by God as my buckler, my protection that's there. He's my buckler. Next, last, he's my high tower. My high tower. You know, we looked at the fortress, and the fortress, right, was there to keep people from getting in. But the high tower was to look out and see where the enemy was and where it was coming from. For you and I, we can't see the enemy's attacks. We don't know what place it's going to come from. We just are to put on our armor every day, Walk with God and trust him. And I trust that he's there. But I can go to him as my high tower who knows what's coming. Who knows that he may be sending me into a storm. When you look at the disciples and it says he sent them to go to the other side, he sent them knowing that there was a storm coming. And there will be times in your life as a Christian that God's going to send you into the storm because he knows what you need to make you more like Christ is going to be a storm. We don't like the storms. I don't think anybody says, oh yeah, send a storm to my life. Send a trial to my life. I would just love to have one. It's been a while. Nobody says that, right? It's when they come, it's like, oh no, right? And most of the time, we're trying to find a way out of it as fast as we can. Those disciples were rowing, right? Rowing that boat as fast as they could to get to, out of the storm. But God put them in there because he knew what they needed and he knew that he was going to come and show himself strong in their storm. And there's going to be times in your Christian life that God's going to allow a storm that you think you're going to sink. You think you're not going to make it out of. You think that it's all over with. It's going to take you out. But God's wanting to show himself strong. To come in and to get you through that storm. But when I go to him and I walk with him as my high tower, I get what I need so I can go through the storm. See, the disciples, he gave them everything they needed to make it through to the other side. And matter of fact, he was going to walk with them and, again, and meet them in that, in that middle of that storm. For you and I, the Bible says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You don't have anything that I don't have or I don't have anything that you don't have that you need to get through the Christian life. You can't say, well, you know what, I just don't have this, so I can't make it as a Christian. I don't have this, so I can't be a godly person. Or I don't have this, I can't be the grandma or the grandpa or the mom or dad that I should be. Because God says he's given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 
So you have what you need. The disciples were there. They had what they needed. He gives us as a Christian. He gives us the armor of God. We've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside us. We have the Word of God that we can run to and we can, we can seek out. But we have to use what He's given us. And I have God who's my high tower, who sees the storm coming, who knows where the enemy's going to attack from, that I can run to for that, His help that wants to be there for me. In Psalms 144, verse 2, my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, who subdueth the people under me. This high tower was used as a lookout, but it was also used to rain down attacks on the enemy. I'm thankful for that when the enemy comes, that God is in control. That the Bible says that when the heathen rage and they imagine a vain thing, the Lord shall laugh at them. He shall have them in derision. He knows that they can't make it past him. There's no way. Job, with all that storm that he went through, remembered and knew God is in control. For you and I, as we look at all the things happening, Whatever may take place in your life, God is greater. He can, he can be all these things that he was to David, to you. You just have to seek him. God is greater. Oh, he's my strength. He's my deliverer. He's my fortress. He's my buckler. He's my rock. He's my high tower. He's the horn of my salvation, announcing his deliverance that he's coming to save me. Hallelujah. What a God that we have. Amen. When we put our trust in him, he wants to be all we need. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for who you are to us. That you love us and care for us. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that doesn't know for sure they have a home in heaven, that they would get that settled today. Lord, maybe there's someone that doesn't have a relationship with you. They've not trusted you. Lord, may they realize how much you love them. Lord, that you came for them and seek your face. Lord, if, they're, if we're here today and going through a storm or going through a difficulty. Lord, may we run to you for our help. May we realize that you're greater than all of it. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed.